welcome to Ghosts and Grit. All right, so we are joined by Brandon Novak. He's a former professional skateboarder turned motivational speaker at this point. Uh, you may know him from Jackass and Viva La Bam. I've known Brandon for a very long time. We talk all things recovery, paranormal. We go into his story, kind of what happened to him, how he got to where he is now. It's really awesome, very inspirational, and I hope you get as much out of this as I did. Brandon Novak, thank you so much for coming to Ghost and Grit. I'm, I'm extremely flattered and excited to partake on this venture with you. Cool. Right well, well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I think you and I... I, I feel like we met in passing many years ago, but we kind of got uh, reacquainted having we did that DEA speaking engagement, which was kind of fucking funny to begin with. <laughs> the fact that we're like the the DEA wants you to come speak at this panel. It was uh, it was strange. I, I think I left with more questions than answers. Yeah. Totally. I was like, are we puppets for some propaganda thing right <laughs> there's, now? There's like, a bigger picture at play and I need to figure it out. Totally, right? And I'm all about the like conspiracy theorists. So I'm like, dude, there's someone that's got an ulterior motive or agenda with us being here. What is it? Yeah, totally. Is it the twelve year olds in the crowd? <laughs> like, 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 the the wheelhouse of, of audience we had that day was It was very strange. It was. We had like the military and like <laughs> every federal agency and this, that and the other. It was it was very it it was a it was interesting. It was. I and kept I, I kept the plaque. I thought that was cool. It's hung up in my office. Yeah. That that, that you know that the street creds are, mm, dude. Totally. I I, uh, I I'm like a keynote speaker for the DEA. Yeah. And they sent me a paycheck. <laughs> I got the DEA paid me for not information either. Right. Like I didn't drop wink, a wink. dime. <laughs> you fucking, Little did I know. You fucking knock, bitch. <laughs> I, I walk out to the uh, to the audience that or the, to the hallway. My publicist takes me out there and. It's like, here, do these interviews, and I do like three, and each one of them, they're like, tell me about the uh, the pharmaceutical epidemic and big pharma. And I was like, whoa, this isn't really what I saw coming. Yeah. Like, like they, it's they're, bad? They're, yeah. What, <laughs> they I, shouldn't I, do it? <laughs> I, I want to go back inside. Yeah. <laughs> like, we we'll go know. hang out with those kids. <laughs> yeah. And eat donuts. Remember there was all those donuts? Yeah. That's right. If that that was, uh, I think that was, I think that was, I think there was irony involved there in was that a, spread. A, a pun intended. Oh, kind of deal. Big time. Big guy, time. Dude, I was standing next to uh, a, a woman, and I talked to her, and then she left, and she's just a regular, matter of fact kind of woman, and and paid no mind to her really. And when she left, her boss came up, and she said, the, the boss said, "You'd never expect, but that woman just partook in bringing down." the biggest drug lord in uh, the history of the United States. Holy Bigger than shit. like uh, Pablo Escobar. Holy shit. And I mean, she was just a chick that I thought maybe would like, you know, yeah. greet you at the door. Yeah, or like be a school teacher or something. Legit, like maybe brought the kids in and are supervising them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this is fucking pimp. Yeah. Dude, I I mean, listen, I, uh, I, I've been, I was a reserve cop for a long time. And so I've always I always get like enamored by that level of like law enforcement. You know, it's always like, oh, wow, like you're fucking co you're committing. This isn't a nine to five for you. This is a three sixty five. And you're actually living a totally different identity. And you're putting your entire life and family on the line in the pursuit of the win. Full on espionage. Yeah. Makes like. Uh, it, it, uh. Would you do it if the DEA called you and they were like. Brandon Novak, we have a secret mission for you. We want you to go down to Columbia and you need to find this guy. Dude, as you're breaking it down, I'm getting like full of butterflies because I'm about to shoot a speedball. I'm getting like so excited <laughs> right now. Yeah, like, dude. I think so. I've already played it out in my mind how I'm going to get there. How do I yeah. get out of the plane? Who will I stay with? But you're going to assemble your own team. But then I think about I and I am good at kind of like, you know, uh, dictating. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a lot of wherewithal and knowledge of like how to put together a car or an engine, so I, I'd be fucked in the woods of Columbia. I wouldn't make it on Survivor or Naked and Afraid. I don't know, dude. I'd. I feel like you could. I, I I guess if I had to. I mean, listen. Don't discredit the fact that like y you you were a competitive athlete. Yes. And you knew how to score drugs in the street <laughs> like those those actually will give you some pretty uh pretty solid survival traits i guess great point jack and, and and skateboarding kind of raised me with the mentality of like 
failure is not an option. And you can take a fucking hit. No is unacceptable. And and so, yeah. I yeah. Use, I, as To prove your point, uh, I, I was referred to as the Baltimore cockroach for many years because I just wouldn't fucking die. Yeah. You're like, dude, like cats have nine, you have like 99. Like, you're just <laughs> like here. Um, so, but with uh, eight, you know, just celebrate eight years sober. Congratulations. Appreciate that, awesome. man. Thanks for leading the way, my brother. Oh, hardly. Um, I, I, I'm i staying at the fucking Roosevelt in a pretty nice, like, bungalow right now. And I like kind of the easier, softer way. Yeah. So it's not, uh, being in, in, a, in the mountains with no clothes on, being eaten by ants doesn't really, like look too enticing to me today i but, think i'd tap out pretty fucking quick but what if it wasn't that though what if it was like hey no you're going in with like the golden ak crew like you're living <laughs> in like a fucking sweet hacienda you've got some like you've got some you know servants you're going in as like your front is you're a drug lord from baltimore you're going down to columbia you're trying to make a new connect Dude, I like this. But okay, as any good alcoholic should or would ask, what's the payoff? What would am I recognized by the president? Am I like the new world leader in fucking dismantling these Colombian cartels? Okay, here's the payoff. You, yeah, the, you can't. It has. What to recognition be, do I get? You get. You get. An, you got a private attaboy from the president. Yeah. We don't know which president uh, though, okay. because <laughs> I get an attaboy from the from yeah. Biden. I don't even think he would know. Uh, he, who, they fucking forget yeah, what we're he, there for. Yeah, he'd be like, "Who's this? Uh, come on, man." <laughs> <laughs> um, but from a president, mm -hmm. maybe we'll say it's like the president of like Switzerland. Okay, you which know? is very neutral <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, in 10 years, you become the drug czar of America and you oversee. Dude, I'm in. You're in? I'm fucking in. Yeah. But that's because, right, and that's from a very a personal uh, attachment and agenda of like f actually a few different perspectives here. One, because like, I see great cross promotional purposes here, and, yep. and and my 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 business pursuits will fucking flourish. Two, the selfless alcoholic in me that's genuinely a twelve step guy and has a relationship with God says that I'll be able to help like fucking countless people. Yeah, which I didn't really understand that until I just opened up my own treatment center. Oh, right on, dude. Yeah, that's awesome. My it's been my dream, my goal, my my the thing that I. I said was my end game. Yeah. And and I'm so blessed to have this opportunity. But but I, I, I opened up my own facility and, and it's in Wilmington, Delaware called Redemption Addiction Treatment Center. And uh I come from that notion, cut from that cloth, like I wanna fucking help everybody. I I, I know is unacceptable, failure is not an option. Don't tell me we can't provide help for this man or woman. Yeah. Um until I became a business owner of a treatment center. Because mm. like I need to pay the staff. I need to pay the mortgage. I need to keep the lights on. And I can provide these help for all these people and I and I and I give away tons of scholarships. But to to offset that balance or to equal the scales of justice here, I have to have like some insured clients to then keep the lights on and sure. pay the therapist to provide this free help. Yeah. So I kind of at this point look at things in two different lights today because of where I'm at personally in my life. Yeah. So fuck you out of the drugs are. Let's go shut down Columbia and let me get all the recognition. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like, just it just sparked in my head. I think you know, not to get overly political or anything like that because it's not what we do here. But fucking, I find it wholeheartedly disappointing that fucking President Biden's son is in recovery, has had a incredibly public journey through addiction and into recovery or whatever and this fucking guy in the highest seat in office has done shit all for fucking the the fentanyl epidemic the, uh, any recovery no, he's ne never even fucking talks about it you would think he would be like hey this is something near and dear to me i nearly lost my son let's allocate you know a, a slither of resources to kind of trying to fight this what i find to be interesting and, and i'm the the least political guy that you could imagine i i really pay no i kind of live in my own world um and, and i don't really i practice controlled media consumption because i know that it will create yeah. the mentality or narrative of how i look at everything so i legit like don't watch it which can make me look ignorant in a lot of conversations because i I have the yeah. knowledge of like a fucking six-year-old but but what i do know to be true and recognizing that 
behavioral patterns of president leading up to the day they or you know candidates before they become president is they're all about that reform we're mm. going to do this we're going to do that and then as soon as they get into office it kind of falls by the waistline Have which you, is rather ironic because my brother's a fucking attorney in the white house holy shit and and he does pensions and benefits Whoa. so like i i I, God bless him. I love him to death. But I, I, you could that no matter how much recognition I got from the world, you could not give me a job in politics. No, fuck that. Hell no. I That's the no evil part. empire right it, there. It, it's all financially incentivized and motivated. Yeah. No one. I. I hate to hear you. Fucking got me on something. I, and by the way, I have no idea of any of the shit I'm talking about. It just comes from a place that I believe, which is my heart, which is very genuine. And I don't believe the majority of the people have the human qualities best interest at heart. Totally. I think you know it's funny, like you're saying, like I, I think they go in being like I'm gonna make change, and then they get in there and they're like, oh, this is cushy. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, you're saying I can become a multi, multi, multi millionaire by buying stocks on things that uh, yeah, you know, I can have influence in. Like, and, and it probably all began with us doing the DEA fucking keynote it, talk. It, we fuck, dude. We, we're part of it, dude. We're pawns in the chess game. <laughs> I fucking Jesus. knew we were gonna crack this, dude. That that was <laughs> right why here, we're right here now. Today. You just fucking witness history, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, but it's it's true. I just I think that they, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah, you know? I mean, look at the the topic that we're on—the opioid epidemic, mm. right? They. They they made the word heroin not so taboo. Mm. They, they it's an absolute fact. You they they started pumping out these oxys like there was no tomorrow. Yeah. You get the 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 Bradley the high school varsity quarterback of his team who's never had an incident or experience with any form of an illegal drug or drug for that matter. But he, he it's the big varsity game. He breaks his clavicle, his shoulder, his ankle, and he's taken to the emergency room. And and now financially incentivized these doctors who've been approached by all these marketers from Big Pharma who are giving kickbacks to 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 get the doctors to prescribe these these narcotics because they say they're non-narcotic, financially incentivized. All of a sudden they put Bradley on these oxy 80s, um, <laughs> which is insane. Yeah. And and they say, you know, take three a day for 30, 60, 90 days, and then 30, 60, 90 days is up, the prescription runs out, and the doctor says, okay, well, uh, I deem you fit to return back to school, no more pain meds. Well, tell that to the fucking body who's now become physically dependent, or the mind who's mentally obsessing over the next time it's three o'clock to take another fucking pill, because I feel so good, and then all of a sudden, Bradley's cut off, he's ill, he doesn't know what he's doing, heroin's still taboo, fuck that, that's for like the guy under the bridge shooting needles and asking for change. I'll just you know, steal mom's purse, steal the wallet, or I have some money in savings, my college fund, and 80s cost at least 80 bucks a pop. Yep. So that 80 and two pills is 160 bucks times that, there you go. And and before you know it, the bank account runs low. And then all of a sudden, Jimmy, the neighbor from down the street, who's like the, the forbidden dope fiend that everyone stays away from, is like, dude, Brad, here's, I can give you fucking half a bag of a $10 heroin bag, and you're gonna get 10 times as high for that 80 bucks that you... And all of a sudden, that word's not so taboo. No? <laughs> yeah, and now, and then the heroin runs out and it's only fentanyl, and now fucking Brad's dead. That's it. Fuck. <laughs> um, so with, uh, so your journey's kind of unique as far as I think the world goes. You know, you were a pro skater. You fucking were involved in the jackass world. How, how, did, how did that come about? How did you end up on jackass? So as a kid born and raised in Baltimore, um, I came out of Baltimore with another skateboarding legend, Bucky Lasik. Okay. And he saw the talent I possessed at a young age, took me under his wing, kind of raised me up and, and introduced me to Pal Peralta, who mm -hmm. I then got sponsored by. Cool. And on the weekends, we would go to the skate park in Pennsylvania called Cheap Skates. And at Cheap Skates, I'm 13, 14 at this time and I meet another 14 year old who looks like me, skates like me, dresses like me, acts like me. And in my mind, I'm like, this kid's going to be a fucking problem because he's very consistent, same kind of skater as I was. And, and that kid turned out to be Bam Margera. Mm. And, and right there at that spot, we kind of became best friends. And every weekend we go to his family's house and we'd stay and we'd enter this contest every year, uh, the Bricktown NSA uh, championship contests and and either he would win or I'd win religiously and we practice all year for this 
One year, Bucky goes to the contest, I don't follow, and, and Bam's there, as usual, and he says to Bucky, yo, where's Novak? And Bucky responds with, I think he's on heroin. <laughs> Bam, being so young, he's like, what's that? He'd never even heard the word. Um, needless to say, I was. He was not. His career continued to like excel. Mine steadily declined, and he then created CKYs, which then turned into Viva La Bam, Viva La Bam into the Jackass. Um, but while he was creating CKY, I decided it was the logical approach to pursue heroin and mm. became like homeless in Baltimore, eating out of trash cans. And and then one Sounds day, tight. yeah, like why would you not fucking think that's a solid decision? <laughs> and then one day, when times got really bad, like skateboarding was the one thing that, that was my God-given talent, right? Like you could be the best ping pong player in the world, but you might not ever pick up a paddle. You know, um, I was blessed with the ability for someone to give me a skateboard and that was my calling and I knew it. And, and I took advantage of it until I allowed to drugs to take advantage of me and I gave away my, my love. So I, I treated it like the love that got away. I wouldn't talk about it. I wouldn't look at it. I wouldn't even fucking cross paths with it unless times were really bad. And on one day in Baltimore, times were fucking tough. And I went into this skate shop where I only when my back was against the wall, I'd go in there and try to hit him up for a few bucks. And I go in and ask for some money, and they're like, no, Novak, we're not giving you money. But Bam was here yesterday doing a demo with the Toy Machine team, and he left his phone number and said, if we see you, to give this to you, and if you ever want to get clean and start skating again, to call him. Two weeks later, so I, I go to the pay phone, and I, I, this is when the pay phones were the deal, and I put 50 cents in, and, and I'm homeless, like legit eating out of trash can. How, how old are you at this point? I'm about 18. Okay. Um, and, uh, I put 50 cents into the payphone, and it's like, that's like the equivalent to like a million to me now, or like a hundred or a thousand. Like it's all I have. And I, I'm, I dial the number and I'm like waiting for the machine to pick up. Cause if it does, I have to hang up before. So it doesn't take my 50 cents. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, he fucking answers. And he's like, what are you doing? And we picked up right where we left off as kids, you know, your best friend. You, yeah. 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 And he's like, dude, you want to stop fucking killing yourself and, and ruining your life and start skating and get down with me? And I'm like, yeah. And, and literally that night, he had me on a Greyhound bus from Baltimore to Philadelphia. So I, I then, he I detoxed at his house. This took a lot of years for it to take, but I would like get high. He kicked me out, a lot of back and forth, basically like a, a battered home, if you will. And, uh, and then... He put me in the CKY videos and then that transcended into like the Viva La Bams. And he's like, you can be in Viva La Bam. You can live at my house rent free. You can have a car. You can have a credit card. You can be on the show. You can get paid, but you cannot do heroin or pills like any downers. Cocaine and alcohol was cool because it was like <laughs> that's you know, fun, it, social. Yeah, it was a socially accepted deal, and and I didn't fall asleep in mid conversation. I didn't try to steal your wallet or fucking total your car. Coke was cool, and and you know he didn't understand that. Yeah, and and that was my introduction into that whole world. Interesting, and. So Which Bam, like, ironically, was super interested and fascinated by the tales that I had huh. from my addiction. Have like, you? Have you? I'm. I'm. I don't know how much into this you can go, but have you been in contact with him late? And I've been seeing stuff in the press, and it's been kind of, kind of gnarly. It is. It, it's very gnarly. Um, and um, there are a lot of people that are extremely concerned. Yeah. Um, and it's really. It's fucking sad. It's 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 fucking heartbreaking. It's as I'm sure you can attest to this in sobriety yourself. You stay sober long enough, you realize that everybody gets a turn. Mm -hmm. And and now I I can see and I'm experiencing firsthand what he felt like when he continued to give me chance after chance after chance, and I would just fucking break his heart. Yeah, and you know now understanding recovery and sobriety and and like really having a a great fucking appreciation for it and more so the disease of addiction. I, I here's the deal, man. In in this whole harm reduction world, uh, or, or like advocacy or recovery, it's like there's no margin for error. Yet it is impossible to do perfect. Mm. So 
I'm not coming, you know, because although he's like one of my best friends in the world and I, I can, uh, I literally, uh, literally attribute him from getting me out of Baltimore to saving my life um, and giving me uh, this opportunity to like have this amazing world and all these, you know, great opportunities. He, um, I'm, I'm married to my narrative because it worked for me and, and, I don't have the answer. I just know what I did, the experiences I went through, the pain that I endured that created this specific outcome. So not that I have the answer, but A, him being like my best friend. And before it was kind of like the deflection thing. He'd be like, well, at least I'm not Novak. At least I'm not fucking doing heroin. To now it's like, you know, you see your best friend who was- <laughs> You've been like, bro. <laughs> yeah, and then he's just like, fuck you. You know, there's like a lot of animosity there yeah. towards, you know, that whole deal and I'm the Mr. Sober guy and fuck you, you think you're perfect and and it's not that way at all. It's just Totally. It and I, I've experienced that. To how your friends that are still in it, you know, or find themselves in it, they get it's like it, well, they get resentful. Yeah. And they and they find anything to kind of at least in my experience, I had people really pick me apart, being like, Look, you fucking sober guy, you think you're better than everyone, and da 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 da. You think you got all the answers, and it's like, no, I just know what worked for me. That's it. Yeah. And that's all I'm doing with him is, and, and not even that he's asking me to do anything with him. Um, yeah. But I, I'm just like, my, my sponsor always in, you know, inflicted upon me that you never get between an alcoholic and their bottom. And, and, you know, without these repercussions from my actions, I don't realize that I have a problem. Yeah. So I just like have created these what I believe to be very healthy boundaries and I will not enable the behaviors. And uh, the moment that he's ready for any form of help, there's me times a million people ready to fucking pounce and legit. Yeah. Um, and but that's as you know, the, the, we can't do this for you. Totally. And, and you know, I don't mean, I don't need to say this. He knows that, you know, any for any person in your life that's in it, they know that like, hey, whether it's subconsciously or, you know, or consciously, they know that like, hey, you know, when I'm ready, I got this person to call. And the sad thing is, is what I've recognized and from my own behavioral pattern prior to my sobriety is I, I generally tend to hurt the people that I love the most. Always. Not the strangers that are just the fucking the hanger ons that are around because they kind of help enable my behaviors. Yeah, when they support a drink or a drug, but the the ones that really love me that are really kind of creating these like boundaries, you know, um, and and that hurts. And it's but but I really try my best to come from a position of understanding as opposed to being understood, you know. And and I know that like hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And 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 who are you or I to be to say what it will be for it to take? I didn't know my thirteenth treatment center was going to be the one. There was nothing different that they told me at thirteen that they missed at twelve, eleven, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, or one. I I believe from my experience the pain had just become great enough, and a series of events had taken place to where a lot of things aligned at once on a particular day that God granted me to fucking find this new way of life. Yeah. It was a series of events. It's not you, just fucking one thing. You weren't thirsty anymore. No, no, I was cool, man. Yeah, it like, really stopped working. Yeah. It stopped. And, it, and it's, and it, we're fortunate, no one to speak for you but myself, like I know I was fortunate to go, to, for it to stop working early enough to where it wasn't too late. Yeah. You know, and that's, uh, you know, that's that's not everyone's story now, especially with fucking fentanyl, man. It's like, I mean, I, I go to, a, what, once, twice a month I hear at a meeting of so-and-so died, so-and-so is not coming back. It's like, it's crazy. I, I also own these, um, I, I own a handful of men's sober living houses. <clears throat> and, and last month, uh, uh, a fellow that actually came from out here in Skid Row who we took to our, one of Novak's houses and, um, he worked his way up the ladder and he became a house manager. I mean, he was living in a tent here in Skid Row, great guy, college graduate, just fell in the wrath of alcoholism and addiction. And, you know, it progressed, things got really bad, which I believe for people like you and I, things have to get really bad before they get really good. Yeah. Um, and then we're, we're divinely inconvenienced 
in just such a way where God will create a, just a big enough gap to allow us to have that moment of clarity to see what life really looks like is. Really, I think the motivating factor in any form of, of change for me comes as a result of pain. Hmm. And, and there's, I, I, I heard, uh, I went to a meeting last night and Jack Grisham shared from TSOL. Mm -hmm. And he's like, dude, no, no spiritual uh, experience was ever won through a very nice day. He's like, it's always just a, a bad event that takes place. It's just like. Sure. Because it's usually, you never are you going to hit your knees on a great day to be like, fuck, help me. I just had this uh, <laughs> jarring, you know, yeah. So for me, I just had a series of these terrible events that ultimately led to this position where the pain became so unbearable that I was willing to do anything. So you think it was just solely that? It wasn't like you met someone in treatment this the, the 13th time or you had some, it, it was just the fact that it had stopped working for you and you wanted to try what long-term recovery could look like? That was one of the things. The other thing was I was 38. Mm -hmm. I was like maturing. I, I wasn't getting any younger. I, I saw all the other people in my life like move on with their life and have families, kids, careers, homes. And I was like alone. And I realized that like it was self-induced. I had created this. I had a million people waiting to be there for me, but my actions created them to to implement this barrier to where they had to love me from a distance mm. because it was best for both parties involved because if you told me you love me i equated that to 10 bucks and i had you <laughs> you know it's just the way that i my mentality is is wound and um and then you know looking i swear on may 25th 2015 it was like the skies had parted and i just walked across the sea i, I recognized at that moment which is my sober date uh that the common denominator in my problems were me. Mm. And like at 13 facilities, I could no longer, uh, I could no longer dismiss or, or, or I could no longer dismiss the severity of my situation, right? I, I, I had been rearranging the furniture on the Titanic for so many fucking years and my ship just plummets and it was it just all kind of like hit me mm. so every time that i went to one of these facilities which most people including myself thought that it was an epic failure because i was like getting high in there amaing to get high whatever these seeds were being planted along the way and then when when a series of events took place for the stars to align and the paths to cross for me to find sobriety they all these seeds that were planted unbeknownst to me blossom like they were on like fucking angel dust just and uh, I got it. I got it. And it mm. made a lot of sense. Now, in the in your eight years of recovery, have you seen your addiction mutate? Have you seen it come out in other ways? Have you seen, totally. have you kind of, like, how's that been for you? You know what? I've, just learning these new things about myself and my life. And fuck it, eight years sober. You're 19. So I can only imagine the... The, the journey you've been on and all these revelations you've had. And I get off on this kind of stuff. Um, for me now, right, uh, having experienced the blessings that the program offers and all the promises and abundance, I've got to a point where my life is like amazing, hmm. amazing. But so much so that with it being so amazing and so full and I have like a crazy chaotic schedule and, and businesses and employees, the things that I did to get me here in sobriety today at eight years sober can now start to look and feel like an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah. I, I can attest to that for sure. It's uh, it's, you know, there are times where I'm like, Oh fuck. Like I got a, Oh, I got my, you know, my men's group. Oh, I got to go to a meet. It's like, you kind of, it, it, it's tough, you know? And for me, the toughest thing is service at this point. Yeah. You know, cause I, I got four kids. Yeah. You know, right. and it's like, and I kind of, I, I kind of look at it. I'm like, man, you know, my service buck, like I'm, a, I'm ser of service to them. Yeah. 24, 24 hours. 7. Yeah. Like I, like I got to leave here at, and then I got to go pick them up from school and I got to go drop one in an appointment. And Legit. Then, like, and it's like, I am. And then I have to take a call from a guy who, who's upset because someone stole his milk in his sober <laughs> house. Totally. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck you. Try yeah. my life. That's what my brain will tell me. But I will say that I did experience a bottom a 10 years sober that was more destructive than 
getting sober. My bottom leading wow, me Jack, to get sober. Wow, Jack, I'd really like to thank you for no, that positive but, encouragement no, I'm just you just saying, shared I'm, with me what to look forward to. <laughs> hey, dude, look forward to 10 years. Your <laughs> you life's going to gonna fucking yourself. suck. You'll find yourself in a, locked in a closet with a gun. Uh, no, but like yeah. it was to that point of I found things were too inconvenient. I wasn't ch I wasn't drinking, I wasn't doing drugs, but my shit fucking manifested in a way that was equally as destructive, you know, and it and it just it it got it got dark, man. And and it's and it's a thing that, you know, my I think my my biggest gripe about kind of I don't even say it's gripe, but I I I I I fell victim a lot in early recovery to the guys on on the on the pedestal, the guys that I saw with double digit sobriety that had all the fucking fixtures of life and everything was amazing and this that, and then they would go out and drink. They would go fuck up. Something crazy would happen. I would find you know some drama, and I would be so disappointed that the guy that I was like, oh my god, like you're the model, you're the guy I'm trying to yeah. emulate. Oh, but you're human. Mm -hmm. Like and and I and I think that there's this. You know, from my perspective, there's been a there, there was so much. I was putting so much emphasis on people that were doing these great things, and I it dehumanized them. Sure, you know, with deeply flawed people. With you know, I, I'm a fucking addict. I yeah. get addicted to anything that allows me to escape. Yeah, yeah. From you know, right now it's jujitsu. I fucking dude. By the way, if you haven't got into that, <laughs> I haven't yet, bro. Let me tell you, best thing I've done for myself in sobriety. Really? Fuck yes. Oh my god, dude! Best thing, wow! That's best impressive. As, uh, outside of recovery, Russell Brand's into that pretty big, yeah, I think. Yeah, right? yeah, it's dude, it's fucking awesome. I would highly encourage you to, you know, when you when when the when you get called to it, if yeah, it if it approaches totally. you, dive in. I just did a tough man, okay, five k the other day, and that like was my oh, I'm like, dude, when do we do the next? Right? Where do we go? How do we set this up to do it every day? Yeah. But, um, weird things. Yeah, but I but I get hooked. I get like, yeah. oh shit! Like I, you know, there's been times where it's been food, porn, sure. video games. It's like anything to where I can shut out the feelings of life and planet Earth. I just I'll you know I'll get addicted. So what's your what's your go to to kind of you know? Well, the cool thing with sobriety, right? We have this heightened sense of awareness. Yeah. So we we don't really drift out to see too much. At least for me, I yeah. kind of have the wherewithal to realize like what the fuck, and and then I rush into a meeting or, or whatever that looks mm -hmm. like. W what do you do when you get there with nineteen years? Uh, tw twenty. Sorry. Um, oh. <laughs> don't don't, <laughs> don't, st don't steal a year from me, bro. Come on. Um, uh, no, it's uh, I, you know, for me, what pulls me back I, like i've had a the a solid group of friends for 20 years you know and getting honest with them but it's funny because there are some things i'll share with some and not with others. like i'm not like open book guy like i do i do have a bit of compartmentalization with friendships you yeah know, like same you know and i think it's i think it's healthy to do that yeah um but it it's it's honestly it's it it's the my my family being responsible for them because I don't want my like I'm the example of a, the way I see it is like I'm the example of a man to my daughters I have four girls sure so I don't want to be a fucking piece of shit for them to be like oh that's what a, a man in my life is supposed to be like and th therefore they will gravitate towards that if you are into the kind of Freudian mm -hmm. kind of you know philosophy on you know what where people end up is kind of where they came from um, so being a good example for them is, is a huge driving force, you know, having the, 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 that core group of male friends that I, um, that we kind of hold each other accountable. It's not as aggressive as it used to be. Uh, but then I also having a, a, a strict kind of a relatively rigid schedule. I think having a schedule is so. That's big for me. Yeah. Very big. Because idle hands are the devil's tools. If I'm left to my own devices and I don't have any commitments, or I don't have anything to do, I'm just fucking I'm a mess. Well, I talked about it last night. You know, I, it had been a minute since I had made it to a meeting, and I had one of my sponsees say, "Like, when's the last time you've been to a meeting?" And and uh, and and what will happen for me is my my alcoholic brain will create these delusional narratives that that fully support my my relapse behaviors. As long as I'm headed towards a drink. Now, it doesn't appear as a drink right now. It appears to like an inconvenience, mm. right? Like, fuck a meeting at eight o'clock. That's insane. I'm in bed by like 
eight and I wake up to go to the gym at five and yeah. uh, and then I, I don't want to take that call with that guy who wants to bitch about you know milk yeah milk like <laughs> you know and, and, and it will snowball in fact and, but that I have this understanding and it, it's another thing that I hear and I, and I really take hold to these tidbits of information because I believe they're very vital I know they're vital for my sobriety is I, I, I see recovery working so well that people will stop doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's insanity. You know, it's like you have cancer and you've taken this chemo and you're about to overcome cancer, but you only have like five more chemo sessions. No fucking cancer patient does skips their last five chemo <laughs> sessions when they're about to like succeed and, right. and be in remission. But with what we possess, this disease of alcoholism and addiction, it lies to us in our own voice and it makes us believe the unbelievable. And check this out, right? Alcoholism and addiction, absolute fact, this is not debatable. If you're diagnosed with that disease, it's a fatal disease. Left untreated equals death. You mm -hmm. die. Don't fucking try to debate it. Waste of everyone's time. Look it up. Fact. But it's the only fatal disease from which we possess that lies to us in our own voice, making us believe the unbelievable, telling, we, telling us that we do not have that disease. Follow me. Diagnose me with HIV. I'm rushing to the hospital to get medication. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. Diagnose me with cancer. I'm rushing to the hospital to get chemo. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. Diagnose me as an addict or an alcoholic. I need a glass of wine or a bag of heroin to figure out what the fuck's wrong with you for diagnosing me with said disease. <laughs> Right? It's just as fatal as the first two diseases. <laughs> Who's that fucking doctor to judge me? Yeah, right. Fuck you. I'll prove to you I'm not a fucking addict. Go, go, go. Or whatever. You know? Like, yeah. I'm going to shoot this heroin at you for being a fucking fool. Yeah. No, it, and, but, that, but that's what I that's think. That's what we're up against. And that's what makes it so complex. And what, yes. And, and what people don't realize is that, uh, I think maybe more people realize than I, I, I'm, I'm saying, but um, it's not just drugs and alcohol no we are as a society now we are wholeheartedly addicted to anything that can affect Dude. a fucking dopamine level yes and it's more from fuck like i was saying phones porn yeah. food video games you know right racing motorcycles whatever yeah it's uh it, it's it's crazy i mean i, I read something that 50 percent of americans are addicted to something I'm actually shocked that it's only 50. Yeah. I don't not believe that in the least bit. And as we know, you know, it, it has nothing, those things, the, the solution to the addiction, whether it's porn, food, is it's uh, alcohol, heroin, it's, it's, it's not even the problem, right? It's the, the behavioral pattern that leads to the, the solution to the problem. Do you, do you think, though, that we as a society you know, in America ha have moved so far away from any sense of faith, spirituality, religion. It's it's becoming a more and more kind of secular society um, to the point where, you know, saying God in the mainstream is uh, kind of scoffed at and frowned upon. You know, I know that a spiritual solution has, is what has given me reprieve from addiction. Is Do you think, though, at our core humans are innately spiritual when you remove any sense of spirituality that's gonna open up the fucking pandora's box great question fuck um at the moment i don't really think that there's much of an emphasis on this um worldly figure that's greater than ourselves yeah. Because in this day and age, instant gratification is the name of the game. And and the quicker that it can be produced, the, the better it's perceived from the, the audience, the public, and, and people double down and buy as much and, and create these assembly lines of things where we're really doing away with humans in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I've pulled up from the airport last night and I saw one of these little like electric, it looks like a, a bomb extraction robot. They, but it's just a delivery service. <laughs> For your food. <laughs> Literally. And it, there's no one around, no one manning it. Yeah. And, and and so with things like that, what are you going to do? Pray to God that it gets there two seconds earlier or it doesn't stop the red light? You know, like I just don't... I. I think that people are so consumed with instant gratification today that that there's so much opportunity and options for these quick fixes 
um, that, that there's really not a, a reason to rely on any form of a spiritual connection or, or, or something greater than ourselves in order to take us to this deeper rooted and seated place for a more humanized experience. Mm. If that makes sense. Like, you know, I didn't come into my sobriety, you know, fucking jumping for joy that I had to get this spiritual experience in order to achieve greatness. I, I, I that wasn't what I even thought about. I didn't even realize my connection with my higher power until around year three. Mm. Um, I just did it because you guys suggested it and I knew that why my way no longer worked. But I had to find myself in a position where where nothing else was working and, and I like wanted to kill myself on a daily basis. I just didn't want to hurt myself in the process. The drugs and the alcohol stopped working and I needed some kind of relief from self. And I, I lost the ability through drugs and alcohol, they no longer worked. So I had to tap into something greater to do for me what I could never do for myself, which was for me, lift me of the obsession and rid me of the desire of a drink or a drug. Something I had tried to do for the better part of 20 years, but I was incapable of producing that result. So with today's day and age, the instant gratification, I, I, I wanna fucking have an orgasm, I hit a button on a phone, two seconds later it's done. There's really no human connection. Um, I, I want to, uh, experience this new service i hit a button it's at my doorstep three hours later through amazon like where where is this need for this relationship with something else yeah that can do for me what a human can't do because at this day and age a human can do it not well a human device did you see the show uh is it mrs davis no dude all right, it's it's very much in alignment of what you're saying. It's basically it's uh, that was a deep question for Christ's sakes. I don't even know if I answered anything. No, that you asked. no, you that did. Was, that was impressive. I was like, wow. I wasn't. I didn't see that coming oh, from you. Well, you know. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> 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 um, but in in the show, Mrs. Davis, um, it's uh, Damon Lindelof wrote it. He wrote Prometheus and Lost, and really amazing writer. He, um, but it's about. It's kind of like a fictitious future. This woman is a nun, um, and this AI has taken over the planet. But the AI has become God because it knows everything about everyone yeah. at all time, and no one, no one has a faith. No one believes in anything. Everyone comes with a barcode, <laughs> basically, right? And she can communicate to anyone at any time. Yeah. She can, the, and everyone's walking around with these earpieces or on their phone. And because this nun refuses to participate in this, um, it in she's on like a Grail quest. She's been tasked to like, hey, you need to go find the Holy Grail, mm -hmm. and because it's proof of God and Jesus and all this, and and uh, the AI doesn't want her to because if she does. It, it's going to completely destroy, you know, the the people's belief in the AI versus in spirituality. Um, but it's a great, great show. It's kind of tongue in cheek. It's kind of zany. It's a little bit like um, I think there's a lot of a lot to, to be said with with that. Yeah, I, I believe that. Yeah. I mean, like this thing I'm holding in my hand. What can't you do with that yeah. except for connect with God? Yeah, it has. It has the it has every bit of information that has ever existed that's published, yeah. you can access through here. Like that's- So why do I need any other connection with anyone else? And that's scary. Yes. And it and it does not surprise me that people are becoming less and less connected to each other. And the opposite of addiction is connection. Yeah. So, right, the more we become disconnected with reality and abnormality, Paired with the fucking coronavirus, which told us to like distance, isolate, and... disconnect, disassociate. Uh, you know, we're not going in a positive direction where I have a very, you know, good feeling about. Yeah, it just. Um. Yeah. I mean, how how was how did you experience you know, COVID and lockdown and, and you know, how was that in your recovery? Dude. Um. Well, from a work sense. I, I was like tenfold busier than I'd ever been because I work in the drug and alcohol treatment field. Yeah. I own sober houses. I own a treatment center. Um, unfortunately, so sad, but relapses. Um, everything that was bad that generally leads to a person realizing they have a problem 
was happening mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. Um, spouses were home with their spouses and they got to witness firsthand how much they drank, how much they drug, with no accountability, no one to check in and, and be presentable to. And now, you know, a, 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 a slice of whiskey at, at dinner after work turned into lunch and then turned in at 10 a.m. And, you know, it just this progression started. And mental health was like through the roof. And so people were reaching out to me. The only thing that changed in my life was my speaking engagements because, as you know, they shut the world down and mm. and they they then you know it's funny we're having this conversation about ai and stuff they i got my first ever laptop during covid really and it was not by my choosing you've never had a you never, never had, had a laptop one. never and I've, to this day I, I don't email I, I have an assistant that helps me with all that yeah but uh i wrote I, my first book in pen and paper Really? Yeah. So you, well, it's funny because you said that, and people do exactly what you did. They look at me in complete amazement, and 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 are they like, "What the fuck is wrong with you? How have you made it this far in life?" Or they're completely like enamored and like, "I wish that I could do that." There's yeah. no like in between. Yeah. Uh, no, I I think I mean well, like you're saying, connection. It's the, uh, you know, it's the opposite of addiction. Yeah. So you're just all about the face to face connection. I, instant gratification. Yeah. And I need an answer now. I, I prefer to talk. A text is okay, but not mm -hmm. really. And if I have something long to write out, I'll write it pen and paper, take a picture, and then text it to you. Really? Yeah. For the most part. Or I'm into talk to text now. Okay. Which fucks up the punctuation. Have so it makes me look borderline like a fourth grader. Have you done the voice? The, do you do the voice memo text? That's advanced, man. Voice memo, talk to text is kind of just okay. new. I'm just breaking that barrier. I like a voice memo text as of late. Well, you hear my voice. Yeah. So you'd be like, hey, what's up? There's like, pressure so to that, though. There is. because you. There is. You know, I, yeah. don't want, I don't want to sound fucking <laughs> off, man. <laughs> the thing I don't like about it is that you, they can be saved. And I'm like, no, don't save that oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Totally. Scary. Um, so, you know, this podcast, it's ghosts and grit. We like talking, you know, ghosts and the grit side of things is yeah. kind of, you know, tough shit that we've had to do whether it's physical or mental or whatever um but where are you uh where are you at with ghosts have you ever had an experience i'm a full-on believer um I, I had one experience at one time in my life that i believe to be true but Let's keep in mind that I was also on a cocaine bender and awake for like six <laughs> days. But nonetheless, and it was at Bam's house. Oh, God. <laughs> which he's got that old castle. Yeah. Right? Does he still have it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He's got this old castle where, where they film the shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, when we filmed the Viva La Bam episode where we came out and got flair from celebrities and we got an artifact from you for that show and you met us oh that's right at a studio and we called you and we're like yo will you meet and you came and met us and you get i forget what you gave us i fucking remember holy shit I, I, you know what i remember because we we got you on the phone and and we're like all right jack we need the we explained what we were doing yeah it's kind of a scavenger hunt we needed a flare from a fucking celebrity and we were like, can you meet us in 15 minutes? And your response verbatim is like, it's LA. You can't get anywhere in 15 minutes. And I don't know why, but I'll never forget that. And that was, before, that was a, my very first Yeah, I remember that. I'm, I, did, I, did I meet you in the valley somewhere? I think that you guys were in might the valley? be right. I think we came to you. Okay. Or you came to us and we were in Hollywood because we then went from you and we saw Dave Grohl. Okay. And that was at Toy. So I have like real, that time period... I have these like weird um, memory, like, like I, to I had no memory of that until you just said it and it came flooding back. And I had a similar thing with Bobby Lee when I did Mad TV with him and I, I would run into him and he's like, oh dude, you remember when you did Mad TV? And I was like, oh my God, totally fucking forgot. <laughs> yeah. Like there's these periods of like, cause I was getting pretty yeah, fucked you were up. Going back. For it. Yeah, I just have zero memory. And then recently I went and like looked up the, the when I went and did Mad TV with Bobby, and I was like, "Yeah, fucking just don't remember." I remember being in the dressing room, but that's it. Sounds like a good day. Yeah, really good day. And I'm like watching myself. I'm like, dude, what I, I strive for days yeah. like that when <laughs> drinking and drugging. Just, just yeah, just complete. But anyway, so your so, ghost story. So I'm at, I'm at Bams and and we're going for it, and um, <laughs> it was. In context, a whole other sideline story, but it pertains to this tattoo right here that I always bet people a hundred bucks they can guess, and and very rarely one person ever got it right. What of what it is? Yeah, 
Can I take a look? You want to do it? Let's see. And okay. Okay. Let's see. So that there. Yeah. Okay. Is it what is it? Yeah. Is it a lake? Okay. Or a body of water? You're fucking god damn it. You're 99 out of 100 close. You're burning. Oh fuck. Do I need to have the specific of what it is or is it like yeah, well, like oh that's for lake my sake cuz I don't want to fucking lose 100 bucks here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um I okay, I'm guessing you're from Baltimore. Baltimore's on the water. Hmm. I love the geographical intellectual approach here, but it's not going to fucking help. Okay. I'm I'm just saying it's a lake or body of water of some sort, and that's that's my final answer. I, and, I don't and, and have I, a specific. I applaud you for that. You're okay. so close. Same, literally, and this is why I brought this into the story. We're awake for six days, sniffing tons of blow. And uh, right before the ghost experience, this happened. Okay. And I'll tell you. So we're shooting a game of pool, 6 a.m., awake for six days, blow, 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 just fucking going for it. We shoot a game of pool. I win the game of pool. We have a tattoo artist at the house with us. I win the game of pool. I go in and lay down on a bed. Bam opens up a laptop, jerks off onto my arm, <laughs> and then we trace the cum around with a black to trace it, and then a new needle just goes over the cum. So his cum is literally in me without ever having to fuck me. So that's pretty impressive <laughs> in its own right. So that little context of... Body of water. Body of water. <laughs> so close. <laughs> and I won the game of pool, which is like, it's just so wrong, it's you right. You won and you got jizzed on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you won twice. That's, I mean, <laughs> shit. <whole> perspective. <laughs> but so the context of, of kind of what kind of week we were having there shortly after that he goes down to the radio room because at the time we have a show on Sirius satellite radio and we do it from the basement of the house and it's a room a bit bigger than this and they work the boards and just party in it we'd listen to music and we'd party in there and then we had this blowout fight and he's in there down there but he's got you know these really big uh uh like fight uh what are those with the big swords and like you know that you have in suits house. of armor. Yeah, suits yeah. of armor. Those humongous swords. And he's down in this radio room, and he's blaring music, and he's screaming at me to come down there and listen with him. And I'm convinced. I am convinced that he is going to kill me in there because he's holding one of these big swords, and it's just getting really weird and really dark. But before I go to walk down, and the the if you ever saw the castle, it's very like spot on like this, like same kind of vibe, same lighting. This is it, and. uh I'm by the pool table, but the stairs that go down to where the radio room is at the bottom of the stairs, and I look at the stairs, and there's this, uh, this, this kind of foreseen shadow, but but uh, like in a illuminating of a woman, and she's just standing at the top of the stairs looking at me as he's calling me down there. Now I haven't looked down the stairs, but I can see her clear as day. And it's like mm -hmm. fucking 8 a.m. So it's not dark. And I see this like illuminating kind of just like a shadow, but not shadow is like a smoke, but not smoke kind of thing. Uh, did it look like, you know, you a TV's not hooked up and it's staticky? It, it had a little bit of that, but it was more so just this really bright, like kind of an outline-ish figure but I could see that it was a woman and she was just shaking her head no and shaking her head no and I took that as a sign of he's absolutely trying to fucking kill me I am not going down there that radio room and listening to music with him and like ran upstairs wow and just fucking and that was I, I know that like I was heavily under the influence and intoxicated with loads of substances but dude that was my experience that I like remember, mm. and and every time I go to that house to this date, I still look at that spot. Did anyone ever else in the house experience ghost stuff? 
that house definitely had some things going on, I, I, but it was never also the kind of house where we took the time to have a conversation like, "What did you experience? Yeah, what did that look like?" Was is it a new new castle or an old no, castle? No, it's old. Oh, okay, it's old, and they had the uh, the the a big war there in the backyard, like a battle of whoa, uh, like it's it's that, and it's in PA, right? Yeah, yeah. You should uh, come do a deal there. Oh, I dude, I would love to do a ghost hunt there. You should. That'd be awesome. It would be amazing. I know you'd you you'd find what you're looking for. I believe strongly. Yeah, well tell tell Bam to get sober and we'll we'll do an episode though. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that'll be what it <laughs> yeah, takes. The Maybe that's what it's gonna be for it to take for him. <laughs> um that's wild. Uh because I, I was I was wondering because, you know, does he he had a lot of antiques in his the house? The brand right? battle. Oh right? the, yeah. That was in his backyard, legit. Holy shit. Legit, like through his backyard. Wow. And no one has anyone ever, and but you, no one ever really shared about having weird experiences there outside of what you happened to you. Um, th- there has been stories, but the the house was kind of like a one of those kind of places. Yeah, where was it like? Is it real or is it like a drug induced thing? Yeah. Or... What do you think ghosts are? I believe that they're just uh, some. We're not the only people on this earth, and I absolutely believe that it's just a spirit from before or after mm-hmm. my life. Right, like I believe that, and this is an opinion. When I pass, I probably my my soul and spirit will just go into a baby or mm-hmm. or a new life creating, or what I pray to be is a kitten. I'd love to be a kitten for the rest of my life. But it has to be like a kitten in like a sweet setup. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like yeah. a kitten at like my parents' house. Yeah, I don't want to be a <laughs> savage like street roam cat, like fucking you Baltimore cat. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's gnarly. <laughs> you want to be a Sharon and Aussie cat? Legit, yeah. Like all these obstacles and nice, comfortable blankets and, yeah. and a loving family to just pet me all day. Yeah, yeah. My my parents' cats just literally fucking eat wherever they want, wherever they want. That's my goal. Yeah. It's gross. I believe I was a cat in my past. Are life. you a big cat guy? Big time. Ah, okay. I'm a strange man. I'm a 44-year-old single man that lives with three cats, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Does Not it, in my world. Does it bring you joy? I fucking, I, I get so excited and happy to see them. Then there you go. You're in a good spot there. I be, I, I hope so. Yeah. Would you Would you go on a ghost hunt? Like a legit, oh, totally. like, I'm all about that. I love that stuff. Yeah. I get off on that. Do you get scared? You know what is great? Pennsylvania, I'm sure you have to know. So I'm into like the weirdest, the books, Weird Pennsylvania, yeah, Weird yeah, yeah. Connecticut, and every state, and it just talks about the hauntings of all the places. And, and we've done that, and, and there's so much in Pennsylvania. We've I've went, done a lot in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Eastern State Penitentiary. Yeah, I used to live yeah. right next to Penhurst. that. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually just at Penhurst like uh, two weeks ago. I know. My people told me about that. Oh, right on. Yeah, I'm like, I'm going to see him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, That it's like crazy uh, infested out there mm. it's because it's 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 old you know it's like old america there so i live in philadelphia and i live in a part of the city called old city okay the oldest part of the city in philadelphia wow. and they do these like ghost tours where you you're guided around the city and they tell us all this stuff so i have a weird connection to pennsylvania um the street the where i grew up in england is a, a town called jordan's and jordan's was a Quaker village Mm -hmm. Uh, and at the end of the street that I live on that's like a little tiny lane it's like it's the side it's one car width wide so it's a pain in the ass driving up and down you have to like drive up an embankment if a car's coming you know towards you Um, but at the end of the street is uh, the the original Quaker meeting house going back to like the 1600s and it was William Penn's house Wow. William Penn left Jordan's to go essentially set up Pennsylvania. Damn. Yeah. Which, six degrees of separation here. I live in Old City, and there's, uh, I live in an old, in 1872, it was a, a, a women's hoop skirt factory. They mm-hmm. made women's hoop skirts. They transitioned it into lofts, which is where I live now, and directly out my window across the street is the oldest Quaker Oats meeting house building in Pennsylvania. Oh, shit. Right across the street. Yeah, dude. Look at that. It's probably William Penn probably built it. Oh, dude, my place has to be riddled with spirits. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if it's that old, there's something. There's got to be something. We are not the only ones. No. Speaking of that, did you see, have you been seeing all the UFO stuff lately? Oh, I love it. There was a guy that came out. Ah, got it right here. Hold on. What's your take on that? <sighs> okay, so I think, I think UFOs are a couple things. Um, 
I think that there's a, I think time travel could be at play. Uh, like, what if we're sending back drones back? It's not necessarily, it's not, you know, everything you see in the sky, it's not an alien flying it. What if they're a type of drone? You know, when people see balls of light, you know, oh, I saw this ball of light moving around. Well, light can move the speed of light. So if you're going to travel across the universe, what if you could create some kind of light drone that can move the speed of light? Why couldn't you? Yeah. I mean, at that point, uh, I think that's some of it. I, I do think that there are aliens out there. I mean, there has to be. Do you see the footage recently of the guy in the plane who yes. it just darted right yeah, past? Yeah, it just came right past. Which the like Federal Aviation, and like they would, you know, they would know any time anything gets merely close to a plane. Yeah. That I thing was right out the window. Yeah. It was right. Uh, yeah, that was the uh that was the the, the passenger plane. He's filming yeah. out the side. Yeah. That was weird. But like and then you see the orb that the the US military released footage from Iraq. Do you see no. that thing? They they've been capturing these strange silver orbs, like these balls, like fucking flying around war zones. And no one knows what the Is fuck they the are. Is that the one the thing they keep blaming on Russia? I think there was an attempt to be like, oh, no, it's some Russian thing. There, I did see something, but it, it kind of was like a blip. But okay. some guy, some whistleblower came out and said um, that, nope, we have downed crafts. We have alien beings. Like wow. some guy j like two days ago, and he's like, and we've been lied to by the government. And when he said that, Shocker. I was like, oh, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> that, what is this? He's, That's this, not true. How could that possibly be? They would never. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's the most honest, It's you know, full of honest Abes. Yes. <laughs> they just sincerely <laughs> want the greater good for humankind. A hundred percent. They have no ulterior motive, no, nor no, personal no, no, gain no, no. from lying. And it all started from the DEA 360 degree summit that we took part in. It is. It's We were the, so, I mean, and look, COVID happened like a couple months later. Very Dude, it's we were merely pawns in the game and didn't even see it, Jack. No, we got fucking. God damn it! Yeah, bamboozled. Well, never again. No, never. Hashtag never again. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. Sorry. Um. All right, Brandon Novak. This has been amazing. This I, has been I, awesome. I seriously could do this for five more hours. With yeah, you. I'm just fucking shooting the shit, talk whatever. But I gotta go pick my kids up before, before they start I asking leave, me for milk. You go get milk for your kids. I'm gonna give my shameless plug. Yes, uh, I was just gonna actually say. Yeah, where yeah, can people man. find you? What's going on with you right now? Um, if anyone out there is in a position that they can't get out of on their own as a direct result of drugs and alcohol and need help, call me or my team. I carry a phone that rings directly to me it's right there and that number is 610-314-6747 and we will do the best that we can to get you the help not only that you need but more so deserve you can follow me on my website brandonnovak.com redemption addiction treatment center just go down one and it will take you down the rabbit hole of the rest that's fucking awesome so you literally have like two phones right there and one is my personal and the other one they're both my personal but like One's a work. If she called right now, I would answer. How, what's the weirdest call you've received? Well, the major not the majority, but a lot of them, I can kind of finish their sentence before them, even before they even start. And they're like, yeah. oh my God, I didn't expect for you to answer. And I'm like, well, I didn't fucking expect for you to call. So we have something in common here. Um, and then they're like, I'll be like, uh, this is Brandon. How can I help you? And they're like, oh, wrong Brandon. <laughs> it's like, well, how do you know it's the wrong Brandon? Like, <laughs> they don't expect me to answer, so they're just kind of like taken back. Wow. Um, and, you know, it's just that. And then I have to go through clearing that up to realize what, like, is there some validity to mm. it? It's just like people wanting to fuck about. And Yeah. Um, and where are your, where's your, what state is your rehab in? And Wilmington, Delaware. Okay. That's oh, 20 that. minutes, uh, 30 minutes outside of Philadelphia. Okay. Um, Redemption Addiction Treatment Center where I'm at five days a week. Uh, I run a 10 o'clock group every morning. I'm generally the first to get there and like the last to leave. I absolutely love it. Damn. It's my favorite thing that I've done thus far in life because I can really be a part of someone's process of wanting to get better but not only when they want to get better but seeing them get better mm. the improvements in their life where their families start to like come and pick them up on the weekends and take them out to dinner and leave them with a couple bucks because they like my whole goal is an agenda is to help the individual return back to the person they were before they gave 
everything that they loved and cared about to addiction. So whatever that looks like for whoever chooses to accept help. I don't like come from this position of being the great I am and having all the answers. I share with you my story. If you find it attractive and appealing enough that you want to maybe figure out a way where we can bridge this gap, then let's fucking do it together. Yeah, that's Um, fucking awesome. Because I'm on borrowed time and if justice was due, I'd be dead years ago. So it's it's simply me playing my part to just kind of try to make the world a bit of a better place. But I just remembered and never forget that my mother bought me a plot 14 years back. And, and if someone didn't pick up the phone that day that I called, like I do for all these others, I'd probably be in that plot that my mother bought me. So yeah. I look at each time that phone rings is God willing one less mother or father planning their son or daughter's funeral. And I wholeheartedly believe that. Mm. So uh, just fucking figure it out, man. Right on. Well, dude, it. I love that, man. I love you. I'm so glad that this happened and it worked out for both of us. Right on, dude. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, folks, if you're watching on uh, YouTube, click like and subscribe. Uh, if you're listening on iTunes, leave a comment. Give us some five stars, all that shit. Um, and uh, yeah, have a good one. Brandon Novak, thank you so much. You're a fucking stellar human being. Go get your goddamn milk. I have to. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.